sing worthy. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. We live for you. Sing this out. Sing Jesus' name above every other name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath could ever be. We live for you. We live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder. Show me who you are.
specifically in this series we are providing a contrast between the things that we can build our life around and what you're offering us instead and I ask that you would open our eyes to the ways that we have not built our lives around you to the things that we are still holding back from you to the parts of ourselves and our lives that we find difficult to surrender completely to you. God, whether that's our politics or the sin that we don't like to talk about or just our pride. God, show us a church that builds our lives around you, that we will see the gospel move in ways that we cannot anticipate and in ways that will remind us so completely of your glory and how amazing your love for your children is. So God, I ask that today we would take more steps to get there, more steps to be the kind of church that has built our life and our community around who you are God, get everything else out of the way so that you can receive the fullness of this church. In your precious holy name, amen. You can have a seat if you're with us today. If you're out on the stream, we're going to take a little video break, and then Pastor Jason will be back in just a second. Stay tuned. Good morning, good morning, people in, in the place, in the, in the building here. Nice to see you. Nice to see some more of you. Uh, I think zero to four, we started getting some people, uh, people coming back because somebody's going to watch their kids for a little while. Uh, they are in the back. They are careful. They are following all the guidelines. We are glad that they're here and glad that you are here. And if you are live with us on the stream, then we are excited that you're here. We understand there's some stream issues this morning. We promise that if this gets interrupted, it will show up uh, later, all recorded for the message. Uh, if you're new with us, though, what we'd love you to do is go to cityviewpairline.com slash hello, cityviewpairline.com slash hello, cityviewpairline.com slash hello, repetition aids learning, and that's one of the things you guys said I do all the time on Facebook, so there it is, cityviewpairline.com slash hello. That is how uh, we want, we just want to get a record of your visit. Glad you're here. Want to be able to follow up with you uh, and touch base. That goes for in person and on the live stream. Also want to give you an update if you weren't here last week or weren't watching last week. We, we did go ahead and affirm the vote to purchase the building. Uh, the elders scrambled this week, and we actually end up closing on the building on Wednesday. So we are official owners of 6301 Broadway. Yes, this is a big thing. Even you live streamers, you should be clapping too. Your kids will think you're crazy, but they already do, so get over it. Um, and and we're, we're going to be sharing some more ideas more things that are going to be going on there in the not too distant future. Uh, very excited for what, how God has delivered that to us. Very excited for how we're going to get to start using that thing uh, soon. We are going, we are in the middle of a series that started last week called Divided States. One of the things we're addressing in this series is the tendency for Americans to divide over our politics. And really the sad thing is the division that the church sees as a result of that. We're always going to have some division based on different things we think or how we want to vote or whatever else, but the church is called to be united. 
not unite around a political party, not unite around a, a particular theme or an idea, but we are united around something that, that, is, that is core to us, and that is the person and work of Jesus. That is who Jesus is and what he's done. It is the gospel that, uh, that, that he calls us to center ourselves around. And so one of the things that we're trying to do in the middle of this series is call us to pray. Uh, and if you are not subscribed already, we are sending out week, daily prayer reminders uh, via text. And we would love to have you uh, sign up for that. You could text PRAY2020 to uh, 281-767-2936. I'm squinting. My eyes are not that good, and I'm reading it from the confidence monitor in the back. So if I got the numbers wrong, don't be mad at me. Uh, you, we would love to have you on that prayer chain that is happening daily. Uh, just different ways, quick reminders, middle of the day for you to pray for our government, pray for these elections, pray for the elected officials that we have, uh, that, that we would mm, not be polarized and partisan, but would be focused on the gospel, focused on Jesus, focused on what he's calling us to do and what he's calling us to be. The Astros are in the ALCS. Are we excited? Yeah. Uh, I love it because we were not supposed to make it, and we made it, and to the rest of Major League Baseball. We are, uh, we, we are proud of our Astros. We're excited for what, what's going to go on. Now, here's the thing. When the Astros take the field today, there are three teams that take the field. There's the Astros, and there's the Rays, and then there's another team, the Umps. The Astros and Rays, they come in, they've got a plan. Their plan is to try to win the game. They want to win the game, win the series, go to the World Series. That, that is the plan. That's what they're going after. They're, they're in conflict over something very specific. But the umpires, they're also taking the field. In a way, they're on the field, but not of the field. They're part of the game, but not in the game. They report to a different authority than either one of the Astros' ownership or the Rays' ownership. They report to Rob Manford, who sits at 1271 of Avenue of the Americas in New York City. He has reps at each game played throughout the league. The officials represent the kingdom in New York on the field. They are distinguishable. They look different. The Astros are going to wear one color. The Rays are going to wear another color. And the umpires are going to wear black and gray. They rule on the field from the kingdom in New York, on behalf of the kingdom in New York. Official is out of line if he joins a team. Now, Sometimes we can't throw strikes. We can't throw strikes. The, the, the guy can't come out from behind home plate and start, and start throwing strikes for us. That's inappropriate. The umpire does not have the right to go up on the mound and start throwing for the Astros or the Rays. Each official has a book that governs the guidelines of play. Their personal opinion is subject to that book. They may prefer a team over another, but preferences need to be subject to the book. Decisions, th those umps are going to make calls, balls and strikes, home run, not a home run, out or not out. And those are going to be subject to cheers or boos. And it can't matter to the umpire which way it goes. It's about ruling in the conflict based on the book they received. We're living in that same cultural conflict. I'm using that as an analogy for us to think through how we live in this world as Christians. We're clearly divided. Clearly divided in this country around, along racial lines, police lines, class, po politics. They're all clashing. What's added to this crisis is that Christians have decided that we need to join the teams and fight one another. The officiating crew is supposed to be in the middle. The officials don't erase the conflict, but the conflict is managed differently because of their presence. We're outnumbered. Christians are outnumbered. But they carry with them kingdom authority. The, the umpires in baseball, they've got the backing of New York City. We carry a different authority. See, the players, they are uh, bigger, stronger, faster. The umpires, they are uh, slower, fatter, dumber.
but authority trumps power. A player can put, can put you down, but the umpire can put you out of the game. Authority is different than power. We've allowed the culture and our upbringing to dictate a team that we end up joining rather than recognizing that we've been called as different part of a kingdom. I asked the boys last week, they, they were sitting in the back, uh, and I said, what do you remember Daddy saying while I was preaching? And, he's, and they said, you said king, kingdom a lot, Dad. I said, all right, good, you took it away. We represent a king and a kingdom, not a president and a party. We represent a king and a kingdom, not a policy. Those are the things that I'm trying to call this church and any church, any person, any Christian who will listen to me to understand something, that we are not about this world. Our world, our home is a different place. You find yourself uncomfortable in this place, and you do because you weren't made for this place. Hebrews says like this, that, that Abraham, when he was seeking God, he sought, for, he sought for a city whose builder and maker was God. Like, I, I feel uncomfortable with both sides of the political aisle, frankly. I keep praying for a third party to rise up in the middle, and I can finally vote for somebody. But I am, I am constantly and consistently disappointed with those elected officials that we end up having. And you know Why? I'm not made for here. I'm made for a king. I'm made for a kingdom. Now, I'm going to vote. I want you to understand this. I vote. I am politically active. I care. I want to see, I want to be a good citizen in this country, in this state, and in this city. I feel like that is exactly what we're called to do. But before I'm called to be a citizen here, I'm called to be a Christian. Before I'm called to be a, a citizen of the United States of America, of the Republic of Texas, of the great city of Pearland, I'm called to be a disciple of Jesus. That's the core of who I am. And if you're a believer in Jesus, that's the core of who you are. I thought it might be helpful to go back to the, the first set of people who be, were called Christians. So I'm going to go to Acts chapter 11. Uh, I'm going to read some verses. We're going to make some points, then we're going to be done. Acts chapter 11, verse 19 goes like this. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. So there was a persecution that happened in Jerusalem. As a result of this persecution that happens in Jerusalem, the, the believers in Jesus are scattered everywhere. Verse 20, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who were who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. Verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them, and all, all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Verse 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And here's the sentence. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. In Antioch, this city, not, not Jerusalem, not Judea, not, not, not any of those places that you hear in the, in the Gospels, not, not Galilee, not, not Capernaum, not any of those, those cities. It was a place completely north, Gentile territory, where disciples were called Christians. That, that, that's, where, that's where it started. That's where it was, began. Until then, they were either called disciples, or they, some places they were called the way. Uh, th th this, is, this is how Christianity gets started, and this is where Christianity gets its name. And note that they're named this not because of some cultural dynamic, but they're named this because of the person that they believe in 
and how they act as a result. They're called Christians because of the person they believe in and how they act as a result. So, number one, taking notes, if you want to, it's on the Bible app, here it is, or you can just write it down or whatever. Here it is number one, Christians believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior and follow him. <laughs> Maybe that, I hope that's basic, and I hope everybody in the room is like, duh. But sometimes I think we miss what's actually going on. We, we tend towards one side or the other here, where we say, we believe in Jesus. We believe in what he's done. We trust him, and we're going to be saved and, and great, and now I can act however I want to act. Or we go to the other side and we say, we, we, we want to do the things that Jesus did. We want, to, we want to serve poor people. We want to help everyone. We want to do all those things, and we disconnect it from the faith that activates it. I, I'm, I'm reminded of what James says, that, that faith without works is dead. If, if you have faith, but you aren't serving, then your faith is dead. If you, and, and conversely, if you are doing works, but there's no faith behind it, then the works are without purpose, without eternal purpose, let's say. So what does that mean? It means looking into the scripture and finding out what Jesus actually said and what Jesus actually did. Who it is that we say we believe in and what we're supposed to do as a result of who we believe in. It's not one or the other. It's both and. Christians, we believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Amen. And we follow him. Amen. We do the things he told us to do. We act the way he tells us to act. And we don't, mm, when we find something that's hard for us to follow, hard for us to do, hard for us to follow through with our personality, we don't say our personality just doesn't allow us to do that. We can form ourselves not to culture, or the Astros or the Rays, or the team that you decide to join, or the Republicans and the Democrats, or the you know, elephants or the donkeys, or whatever. We can form ourselves to who Jesus is and what he's done. We don't conform ourselves to the patterns of this world. And, and maybe one of those things that, that we miss a lot as Christians, and I, and, I, and I think it's just true, so true in the election cycle and uh, over this last year, you see it all the time, is, is we forget maybe that this thing, the identifying mark that is supposed to be true of all Christians. This is the, the thing. There's one thing. Jesus makes it real clear. There's one thing that you're going to be known by. You're going to be known by one thing. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another by this. So this thing, your love for each other, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So in that two verses, he says love once, twice, three times, four times, four times, two verses, love. What do you think Jesus wants his disciples, his followers to be known by? You guys can shout it out there. You guys can shout it on the stream. It's love. Guess what it's not? Your political bumper sticker. The t-shirt that you wear. Now, if you have a t-shirt that you wear that says, Biden-Harris, Trump-Pence, Giant Meteor, 2020, whatever. We're not going to get down on you for wearing a t-shirt, but that's not the thing that you're to be known by. It's not about the fish on the back of your car. You are to be known by your love. Sadly, Christians as a whole are far more known for the things we're against than what we're for. Far more known for the things that we 
do poorly. Now, sometimes that's just because we, we don't get reported on fairly, frankly. I think that's true. But I think if we were also overdoing it in the love category, it would be really hard for anybody to misreport on what, we, what Christians do. One of the things I love, I, I hate disasters. I hate disa- I hate the hurricane hitting. I hate fires in California. I, I hate that stuff. It's terrible. It's, it's, what it is is you see, you see the, the broken world just going to pieces without Jesus. But one thing I, I love after the disaster is that Christians are the ones who jump in there first. I don't know if you know this, we are Southern Baptists. We don't talk a lot about it, but we are Southern Baptists. And the Southern Baptists are the first ones in to almost every disaster throughout this country. The Southern Baptist Disaster Relief, they they were on the scene in Lake Charles and on the scene throughout Louisiana before any other group, before the Red Cross was there, before any other group. We contribute to the Southern Baptist Convention. That's part of how our tithes and offerings go. That goes that way, and we help, do, we, we, we help in those things. That doesn't get a whole lot of publicity, but it's part of who we are. It's one way that we get to show love to people. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a liberal, and, uh, and you know, yes, that's possible. You can be conservative relatively, and you can have liberal friends. Um, and, and they were talking about how frustrated they were with Christians. But then they pointed out, during Harvey, they were all over the place. They were helping everybody. Understand, it's noticed when you do show love. It's remembered when you do. Believer in Jesus, how are you known individually? If someone comes from outer space, opens up a whole other can of worms, and suddenly was exposed to your text feed, all your social media, they, they have essentially done what Google has and just tapped everything that you have. And they were to look at, at, at just the content of what you've sent, said, or done. Would it look like you were loving others? Or would it look like I don't know. Anger, hate, frustration was what carried the day. See, Christians, we're to be known Christians are to be known for their love, not their anger, not their frustration, not their political stance one way or another. We're supposed to be known for our love for each other. How are you showing love during this historic moment? I want to bring up something uh, that maybe we can do as a result. Uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana is a city that has been devastated over the last month. Uh, they've been hit by two hurricanes now. Um, and we have, uh, you know, Jennifer Morton and David Morton. Jennifer was raised in, that, in a church there where the windows were totally blown out. The, the furniture was sucked out of the windows. The whole thing is a mess. And people all over there are suffering and hurting. One thing that uh, we've tried to organize and we're working on is, is getting together some gift cards, getting together some money so that we can send back to that church to help them out and help the people in that area out. If you want to be a part of that, you can give online at, at, at you know, via our giving portal, cityviewtx.infellowship.com, uh, cityviewtx.infellowship.com, and you go on there and choose disaster relief, and that money will go towards this specific problem, this specific heartache, this specific thing, we'll make sure that money gets directed to help that church and those people in that city. Final thing I want to say, a little grammar lesson for us. You know, everybody loves grammar, right? Uh, Who loves grammar? Anybody? My wife is here. She'd raise her hand. She's probably raising her hand at her home right now. One of the things we end up doing is we put the word Christian as the noun and not the adjective. What do you mean by that? I mean, we're 
conservative Christian or we're liberal Christian. Uh, I, I mean, we're Southern Christian, we're black Christian, we're white Christian, we're Asian Christian, and we, and we put Christian as the noun. And what the noun does, it sits there, and the adjective describes. So that the White House, what color is that house? White. The blue car, the small feet, the, the tall woman, the whatever. We put Christian as the noun and then let it be modified by whatever goes in front of it. I'm a Republican Christian. I'm a Democratic Christian. I'm a liberal Christian. I'm a conservative Christian. And I understand some of the reason for that. This is just a point. That Christian is a word that modifies us. That we are changed, and that word modifies who we are and what we are about. So I'm a Christian American. I'm a Christian Texan. That modifies the way that I see the rest of the world. If that's the first thing that I'm supposed to think about, the first thing that I'm supposed to be about, the first thing, then let's, let's think of ourselves that way first. I'm Christian before anything else. The core of who I am is not my politics, is not the party I vote for, is, is not the, the, the big issue that I stand for. The core of who I am is my belief in Jesus and me following him. Christians were first described that way because their actions lined up with Jesus. They were first called Christians because they looked like little Jesuses. Christian modified them. Being a Christian modified their actions, their stances, their positions, how they walked about this earth. It should modify yours. It should modify how you talk to your neighbors. It should modify what you post on social media. It should modify how you vote, frankly. It should modify. Being a Christian modifies the entirety of our experience. One of the exciting things that we're going to do in this series is we're getting to, uh, to show people who, whose lives have been modified throughout COVID by the work of Jesus. And we're going to do that through baptism. Uh, I'm going to pray, and we're going to have the announcements play, and then after that, uh, you're going to, to see Buddy Youngblood come up and be baptized. Jesus changed his life, and we're excited for that. Father, thank you for who you are and what you've done. Thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. Lord, I pray for Christians that we would that we would uh, be salt and light, Lord, that we would help to bring love and hope and peace and joy to a culture that's broken apart. That our humanity would not sit in the adjectival position, but our Christianity would, and that would modify everything else about us. Lord, thank you for how you've changed us. Thank you for how you've transformed our hearts, regenerated us through the Holy Spirit. Thank you for Buddy, who's trusted in your son and is showing that forth in baptism. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Good morning, City View Church. I'm your host, Francis, and you're watching CVC TV. Thank you for choosing to spend a part of your day with us. Whether you joined us in person or online, we're happy that you're here. If you're new to City View, we would love for you to connect with us on our website at www.cityviewparaland.com slash hello. At City View, our main goal is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with you. If you have questions about who Jesus is, or if you accepted Jesus today as your savior, we encourage you to go to cityviewparaland.com slash Jesus and tell us how we can pray for you and support you. City View is going to walk together in daily prayer as part of our upcoming series, Divided States of America. It's about much more than just politics. This prayer journal will guide us through conversations with God about our identity in Christ and the church's role in our lives. To sign up, text PRAY2020 to 281-767-2936. In this time, it is very important that we all maintain giving as much as we feel comfortable. Your giving is how City View can continue to be prepared to serve and love the community during COVID-19. 
This week, we'll be rebroadcasting this stream on Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. Be sure to share that stream with friends and family who may have missed this week's service. Thanks again for joining us this week at City View. If you're in person, be sure to stick around a few minutes to say hello. We can't wait to see you again soon. All right. Well, welcome again. This is our second week of baptism, and uh, I get the honor to do it again, uh, this time with a much bigger kid than last week. Uh, Last week I was able to pick that. I'm not going to be able to pick you up and put you in there. So if you could just uh, stand there and sit, like sit in there. No, I'm not. I'm already got to have a hernia surgery or something. <laughs> All right, so yeah, this is Buddy. And it, and uh, what's so great about this is, man, this is an adult man that's come in front of you all to be baptized. And the water's really cold. And he's like, hurry up, Travis. Uh, I want to get through this. Uh, but... Man, it, what, it just excites me because as an adults, you know, sometimes we have pride or sometimes even fear to get up and do something like this. But Buddy uh, loves Jesus, and he wanted to show people that he loves him. So we're going to baptize Buddy now. Father God, I baptize Buddy, my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, raised in the spirit of you. Thank you, Buddy. We love you. And we are still praying for you through your walk with Christ. And uh, you can get up now and get out of that cold water. Yeah, there you go. All right, so I'm going to pray and we will be dismissed. Father God, we come to you. We, we thank you for this baptism. We thank you for Buddy who uh, loves you. And uh, even through struggles as in life and, and as an adult, uh, he has come forward to show people that he loves you and I pray that this God will uh, just give uh, courage and and encouragement to others that that need to come forward to know you and those that even maybe want to be baptized Father God Uh, I pray we go through this week Lord that we'll put you first in everything that we do in your name I pray amen dismissed